Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Streamlining Efficiency, Automating and Compact Spaces. The presentation portion of the webinar will last approximately 30 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Our presenters are Matthias Kahn and Heath Clifton. Matthias is responsible for increasing the leading position of Stobley Robotics in the food industry. He is actively growing the food market team, which provides food pro producers and processors with their unique robotic knowledge, backed by almost 20 years of food application experience. He joined the Stobley Corporation in 2019 as the North American Business Development and Marketing Coordinator for Robotics. Prior to that, he focused on B2B global marketing, ensuring he recognizes the challenges and customers face. Keith Clifton serves as the Director of Automation and Controls at Insight Solutions. Keith is dedicated to bringing Insight's hygienic design and food processing expertise to clients who want to automate and improve their operations. He has 20 plus years of experience in engineering, controls, and automation, including nearly five years specifically in the food industry. Thank you, Matthias and Heath, for joining us. Today's presentation will provide a brief overview of comparing Delta and Scara robots, discuss hygienic design, retrofitting equipment, mounting options, and fenceless applications. Then Matthias and Heath will discuss some successful solutions currently in operation. Finally, we will have a Q&A period. If at any time during our presentation you have a question, please submit via the questions tab in the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we will respond at the end of the presentation. Or if we do not get to your question, Matthias and Heath will respond to, your, respond to you directly via email. With that, let's begin. Heath? So when you're looking at Delta robots versus Scare robots, I think we're just going to discuss Deltas here on the on the top half. Um, so Delta robots are also could be called spider robots. Um, you know, they're very ideal for high speed pick and place, you know, assembly and inspection. Um, you know, they uh, you know, they generally don't have a, a heavy payload, but, you know, very high speed. Um, they work underneath themselves. Um, also, when you're using, you know, an inspection equipment, you really need, uh, you know, a camera that sits pretty much almost right underneath the robot. Um, you know, Delta robots generally are, are only going to be mounted above above the conveyor um, up top. Um, a lot of times, they can be very high up on the um, up on your frame. That way, you can get up and move out of the way if you have any other applications that are are doing in that, you know, working in that space. Um, you know, they're, they're really great for speed, um, really great to, uh, uh, you know, to, to try to, to pick out food and different things like that. So, Matthias? Sure. So, yeah, I can add to uh, to what you said, Heath. Uh, obviously, the Delta spider robots are, I think, kind of, kind of uh, very common in the food industry. It's probably the ones that uh, people are seeing the most uh, currently. Uh, but we kind of decided to take a different approach at Stably with the uh, the four axes or scare robots that you see here at the bottom. Um, so like you said, you know, going back to the deltas first, uh, they're very fast. You know, the payload, you know, usually like three to six kg. Um, they they rather travel well on the z axis because of their kinematics, and, and they're pretty fast. Uh, but they do also have some some other you know disadvantages that we we look at as a robotic manufacturer, and we wanted to to offer a different uh, answer. Uh, so when you look at them, you know, uh, if you see the picture at the top here, this is one of the newest models, probably one of the most hygienic ones in, in this case. Uh, but most of them have hollow shafts. Uh, that is typically not a great thing in hygienic, you know, designed. Uh, they, as you as you mentioned, Heath, they're always over the product, over the conveyor. Um, they're really high up uh, on the big frame. That makes, you know, cost uh, pretty high with a stainless steel frame. It makes more things to clean. It's also hard to reach, you know, for people who are doing the cleaning, they have to... Uh, to get up on the on the conveyor, they have to get up on the on the ladder uh, to reach the top of that robot and above with the hose, and that's typically something that's kind of like thrown upon uh, nine cleaning procedures. Uh, so people tend to not really like that. Uh, ideally, you'd have to disassemble them to to clean them correctly. And most of them have a plate at the bottom where all the different uh, axes kind of join here. Uh, so this one here has a slightly different design, but a lot of them have a plate that is a, a great spot for retention. Uh, so again, not really ideal. Um, so what we we did at Stably was to uh, really take our approach of specialist in uh, in tough environments and hygienic environments, and we thought the Scara robots uh, that you can see here in bottom right were a better approach. Um, they are smaller, much more compact. Uh, in some cases, we're able to reduce the footprint of a cell between deltas and Scaras by 30%, sometimes even more. 
uh, they move a little bit slower, but in most cases, for example, when we put three scaras to replace two deltas, we're achieving a better uh, rate at the end uh, with three uh, of our robots versus two of the spiders. And uh, that's again, in a, most of the time and all the time, pretty much in a, in a more compact form. Uh, so that's a big advantage. Uh, they're more flexible and can be reaffected pretty easily. We're talking about retrofitting. Uh, so those robots are also easier to move around because again, you don't have that big frame. So you can just you know, mount them somewhere else and do a different application. Um, they um, are easier to clean. Uh, they're fully enclosed. Uh, they can be clean in place. Uh, you, have, you can release the brakes, push them on the side and access all the points of the robot, both sides. Uh, it's pretty easily, no need, pretty easy, sorry. No need to climb on the on the ladder or a step stool or whatever to reach the top of the robot. Uh, you can just you know clean them in place pretty easily from the ground. Um, the uh, visual inspection most of the time, I think Heath talked about the cameras too. Uh, it's typically easier with the scares because again they're more compact. They stand more um, on the side, less in the way of the the field of vision of the camera system. So you can have one vision system for three robots in a very compact space. So you avoid all the risk or you minimize because uh, you can never avoid it totally, but you can minimize the risk of slipping and stuff with the product on the belt between the uh, location of the visual system and the picking with the robot, for example. Uh, so these are big things. Um, and then uh, on the compact side, uh, we are actually just launching this week at Automatica in Germany, a smaller controller. So even the controller can be you know, much smaller and more compact for easy integration uh, in, in tight spaces. And uh, that's all I can uh, say about the scares. It's already a good uh, overview, I think, but uh, these are the main talking points here. Matthias, were you gonna talk about the hygienic design of the scares? Oh. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure if Amber was going to jump in in between. Um, so um, yeah, switching on to uh, hygienic design, excuse me. Um, a big thing that I wanted to talk about today was uh, IP rating. Uh, a lot of people kind of, um, you know, sees that they see that as the uh, the overarching uh, standard. Uh, well, IP rating is is only a rating of of resistance to pressures, and that's what I wanted to really highlight here. Uh, it doesn't mention anything about hygienic design about chemical resistance. Um, so, you know, IP65, 67, 69K that people are used to see, uh, these are only indications of resistance to pressure. And so there's more things that you need to consider uh, when you're placing equipment in, uh, you know, primary applications and food grade applications uh, than just the IP rating. And the main thing is really, um, you know, chemical resistance, that's a big thing because most uh, robots cannot be placed in primary environment because they don't resist the chemicals are used to clean uh, equipment in primary environments. Uh, so we actually offer you know, a, a pH resistance from two to 12 of a specific food coating that we developed over those two decades of experience in food. We keep improving that, um, but this is a big thing. And then the hygienic design, again, having a fully enclosed arm that has no retention area, everything drains from the top to the bottom of the robot. We, you know, uh, have special seals, uh, special bolts that we use, um, and everything to really make it a fully hygienic cleaning, uh, cleaning place uh, equipment uh, is what we do. We use H1 food grade oils in our robots without any loss of performance or impact on the lifetime of the gearboxes. Um, we pressurize the arm also to prevent anything from entering uh, inside the arms that could be, you know, a risk for the consumer or a risk for the robots itself. So we have that, so we don't have to use any covers. Uh, those covers, they can be quick, um, costly, they can uh, rip, uh, they need to be replaced every so often, they create condensation. There's many issues with those covers on the robots. So our approach, again, as a specialist, was to get rid of those covers and propose something that's sort of unique, but that allows to have no covers. Uh, we resist to the washdown. Um, so the pressures, the high pressures, we resist to the chemicals. We have no retention. And again, we don't need those big, uh, uh, robot uh, frames that you would have to have of the spider robots, for example, that goes over the conveyor. Uh, we also statistically spend less time over the product, over the conveyor, so you're reducing your risk for the consumers as well on that side of the kinematic of the scares. Uh, so that's kind of what I wanted to say here about the hygienic design. Some, something else I wanted to say, Matthias, um, before we kick over, Amber, sorry. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, and we, I hear this from a lot of our customers, get caught up with the everything has to be IP69K, 
um, for it to go on a primary site application. Um, I, I don't know who started selling IP69K as everything has to be IP69K, but that's definitely not not true. Like you said, you know, the IP rating really only discusses, you know, pressure and water, you know, IP67, you know, even some IP65, depending on how it's, you know, put together is perfectly acceptable for primary site applications and work just fine. You know, I know that's really where the industry is going. You know, everybody wants everything to be IP 69K, but some things just aren't available there yet. And I just, I always want to say whenever I have the opportunities that customers don't have to, it doesn't have to be IP 69K. IP 67 is perfectly acceptable and, you know, is used all the time in primary site applications where it's a high wash down, high chemical use area. So. Yeah, I think you make a you make a great point, Heath. Uh, definitely, you know, again, we've we've been doing that for for over two decades, and and just like any piece of equipment, you know, we we provide uh, guidelines and best practices, right, to to ensure that the the robot is going to be is going to remain healthy and and perform well in the environment that uh, we uh, we designed the cell for with the robot, uh, with partners like Insight. And so I think yeah, if people you know just follow those guidelines, uh, if people are mindful uh, that now they have you know. Uh, sort of technology that is a little bit newer to food that functions really well that is proven but that needs maybe some some um, some more uh, attention uh, that's that's the main thing really but ip67 again we, with us we've been doing that for a long time uh, it, it resists really well um, ip69k is really overkill i know it's the kind of you know the, the way machines have been built forever and and some of them, you know some machines in food uh, processing are because of their design and uh, their the way they function are a little bit easier to design to that standard that robots. Uh, obviously, robots with a lot of articulated joints and, and seals and everything, it's much harder to reach the IP69K. Uh, it's not something that we will never attain. I'm not saying that, but uh, right now, IP67, again, like you said, has is, is been perfectly suitable. Um, it's just a matter of educating people on that. So retrofitting, you know, uh, current equipment, you know, this is something, you know, we, we work with Stabile a lot. You know, Matias touched on it when he was, uh, you know, talking about the Scaras. You know, you, you can really fit, um, you know, Scaras into a small space. Um, you know, if you look at a Delta versus a Scara, you know, we've been able to fit four Scara robots into the space that you could fit one Delta robot. Um, obviously, you know, that gives us a little higher throughput. Um, but it also gives us more flexibility. You know, when you when you have one one robot that has to pick up all of uh, whatever product it is that's coming down the line, um, you know, you have to do it with one. You have to get very creative with um, robot heads and you know things of that nature. Um, but with the scares, we can you know really design and you know fit things into a smaller space. You know, that's one thing I feel like you know Insight as a company is really good at. You know, we we can you know look at a customer's area that's you know that they have to retrofit. Um, and be able to set things over their existing conveyor lines, you know, not have to take it out, you know, and, and just fit fit everything into a small space, which is why we really like the Scaras. Um, you know, if we have to go to a six axis just for other opportunities, you know, Stobly makes smaller six axis as well that can fit into small spaces and and give you that flexibility that you really want. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're retrofitting current equipment, it obviously allows you to move team members to other places that, you know, robots maybe haven't been able to, um, you know the technology hasn't advanced enough to be able to do those things and you know there, there are things that robots just can't do and probably won't ever be able to do which is why you still need those those people there um, one thing i always try to talk about too with our customers is you know i think people get into the mindset of when they want to retrofit something that if they have six people on the line whatever you know application or solution that any company comes up with is they have to replace all six of those people and, you know, I, what I always try to encourage our customers to look at is, you know, if you can replace all six of those people, that's fantastic. Um, but, you know, can can you get rid of four of them or, or not get rid of, excuse me, you know, reallocate four of them, you know, four or five of them and, and still have a person maybe, you know, the robot can't quite do everything it needs to do, but it can, um, you know, get 98% or 99% and you just have a person straightening, you know, Things like that still allow applications to be successful and still allow great payback, um, you know, and being able to get that uh, get that technology in there and on the line and be able to automate that process where, you know, instead of just, you know, if something's not working, throw more people at it. So there, there's definitely great opportunities for retrofitting um, with Scaras um, and even with six axis robots um, to get that ROI and payback. 
yeah, I really like that uh, that like comment that that last comment that you you made, uh, Heath. I think uh, that's a great way to look at when we uh, when we tour plants and you know, we say the same thing to people. It's you know, let's start with the the low hanging fruit. Let's start with the easy to automate application that you have. And if you have to keep some operators uh, around uh, for the more you know nimble tasks, for the more complicated tasks, then you know we can start that way. Have a small cell that is successful at you know a specific task removing some of the bottleneck that you're currently facing as a customer. And then, you know, um, once that is proven and that is successful, then we can move on to, you know, the, the other applications that the manual operators are still doing and then try to see if we can automate that. But you want to start, you know, start small and, and be a little bit conservative. And then once you have that, that's working really well, then you can move on to the next. So just like you said, I think it's, what, you know, the approach that people should take is not try to replace, you know, 10 operators out of 10, on the line, but maybe you know, start with you know what's consuming the most you know labor for the the most repetitive and and simple task. Uh, maybe it's six out of those ten people, and then try to replace those six, keep four, and and then you know you can reallocate those six people because as we know, all the food plants are struggling with labor uh, right now. Um, and then you can you know later on tackle the the further operations that the the four operators remaining are still doing, and then see if you can automate that task as well. But that's that's a really good the good approach. Um, on our side, one of the big things that we do too uh, is we make sure that we're agnostic uh, as far as communication. So we are OPC UA. Uh, we can literally talk to any uh, other device on the on the factory floor. So that's a that's a big thing for us. Uh, it's very easy for us to talk to any vision system, uh, any kind of you know devices, peripheral devices that you may have in existing machines. Uh, we can talk to them. Uh, so that's a big thing too that really facilitates the install uh, in existing lines and with other pieces of equipment around the robots. Uh, it's that communication side. We're very, again, small, compact. Uh, we're also usually, usually pretty light. Uh, so as far as the weight of the machines is concerned, uh, we're pretty light. And uh, we offer flexible mounting options uh, to make that uh, that integration more easy, easy uh, easier, uh, excuse me. Uh, in those existing layouts. Uh, we even have a solution called Univa PLC. So if you have PLC programmers, they can actually send commands and, and write applications uh, in the PLC world, and they can uh, send those commands to the robot without having to fool with the uh, programming language, which is VAL3 for Stavli. Uh, so that's also something in food plants that have been sometimes quite successful because there's more PLC people than robotics people today. Yeah, um, I, I I think what you said too was a good point. Um, I just want to kind of go back to it is, you know, when, when customers are looking at what applications they want to, to retrofit, you know, the low hanging fruit is is where, where you always want to start. I think um, a lot of times people see, you know, there's 10, 12 people on this line, this is where we need to start at. But generally, if there's that many people on the line, it's going to be a more complicated process. Um, you know, we definitely try to encourage customers to find maybe some of that lower hanging fruit. You know, they can get a robot in because a lot of the customers that we work with don't have robots currently. You know, they know they need to automate and they know they want to put robots in in their facilities. Um, but get a lower hanging fruit project, you know, get a robot in, get your you know plant employees used to it, get your maintenance guys used to it. You know, I'm, I'm glad you touched on the PLC part of it because there's, you know, we see that also is that there's a lot of uh, a lot of customers don't have the maintenance and support um, that they need to, to potentially be able to put some of these projects in. So being able to, you know, communicate with it over, a, you know, in a PLC programming platform that they already um, are aware of, they don't have to learn a whole new you know, programming language to run Stobly robots is, is really great. And um, touching on the, the flexibility, uh, we kind of touched on the mounting options, but uh, that was something that I think that's important also to highlight. Um, our robots, the, the Scaras, the four axes, and also the six axes robots, uh, for most of them, uh, except the very large ones, obviously, but uh, um, all of our other small to medium robots uh, can be mounted basically any way uh, people want or need. Uh, so we can attach them to the ceiling, like you can see the scare here, that's the ceiling version uh, on the right. Uh, they can be full mounted. Uh, they can be mounted on the wall, it's sort of like an L frame, like an elbow frame that uh, you mount on the wall and the robot would be mounted to uh, that frame. Uh, they can be mounted on tables. We have people looking into, you know, uh, sort of like flexible cells that they can move. Um, we have robots on AGVs, for example. Um, and then um, the last thing I wanted to say too is that we work with Insight 
uh, on applications and we try to also determine the best configuration and the best location of the robot based on the application and the existing layout. So uh, we have a software to do that. Uh, Insight works on that with their technical team too. And we can determine the best location, the best uh, configuration, if it needs to be ceiling mounted, floor mounted, because that sometimes has an impact on the performance and the rate that the robot and the cell can achieve. So we tend to work on that too, uh, really to uh, adapt the robot to the existing layout, to the, 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 new, the new cell design, uh, the best that we can to offer the best performance. Uh, so that's something that I kind of wanted to touch on here uh, was that flexibility in the mounting options and how we determine the best position in an existing layout with the robot. So we have software tools to do that with our engineers. So fenceless applications um, with Stobly robots, this is something, uh, you know, inside as a company that we've done, this is our fenceless palletizer um, on the right here. I know we've, we've shown it off at some of our shows, but um, the, the really the secret sauce that, uh, um, that Stobly allows us to do is that it, it has a, um, a SIL-3 um, safety PLC built inside of the controller. It's a PLE level um, uh, safety rating. Um, and that, that really allows us to integrate the uh, area scanners directly into the, into the robot controller itself where it's not running through PLC or other safety controllers. Um, you know, I, I think potentially Yaskawa has one, but um, you know, really the Stobly one you know, from my experience is, is, is the best one, you know, it allows us, you know, obviously you can see in this application use, to use a larger robot, we can have heavier payloads, um, you know, obviously a full wash down area, you know, we have some customers that are palletizing, you know, in, in their primary side application. So that gives you the opportunity to, you know, have a fully washed down, um, you know, palletizer or, you know, any, any other applications, you know, we've worked with customers on tray loading applications or, um, you know, loading any other projects or any other products, you know, on their on their floor that, you know, putting a large safety cage around it just it just isn't an option. You know, they want, you know, small footprint, small floor space, because, again, you know, if you're retrofitting or even um, even a new, you know, new new builds, you know, people don't have a lot of space in food plants. So um, all of that is really designed, you know, to take up less force floor space. Obviously, we're using the area scanner so you don't have to have, uh, you know, a, a fence on it. Um, with the area scanners, it's going to automatically slow down and stop. Um, you know, and, and really, you know, the nice thing about this is, is, um, you know, where a cobot would normally, you know, it only had, it can only go, you know, a certain speed, um, you know, because it still has to slow down and bump into you to stop. With the area scanners, you know, depending on how much area you have, you know, you can get the robot up to full speed um, to be able to run your application. You know, if you have a slower application, obviously we can shrink that area down a little bit to, you know, because the robot's got to run a little slower to give it the, the correct amount of time to slow down and stop. But, um, you know, fenceless applications are, are really going to be the thing in the food industry. I think that, you know, people are going to want, we have a lot of interest in it and um, have a lot of applications where this, this works really great. So. Yeah, I think that's a great thing that you just mentioned, uh, Heath, because that's exactly the approach that we took, you know, kind of like when I was talking about, you know, when we came at the, at the fork in the road uh, between, you know, making Delta robots or just, you know, going ahead with scare robots that we we're making, uh, we kind of took the same approach here for the, the six axis side where we looked at the cobots, the lightweight cobots, and we, you know, we thought, okay, Stably is known for high performance, high accuracy, high durability, reliability uh, because you know we're the only one in the world that makes its own gearbox for example and things like that so we didn't want to go away from from the core dna of our robots and we said okay we're going to remain of a high performance machine and so that's kind of the approach that we we took here so we have the cs9 controller is still 3 ple rated for for safety and fenceless applications uh, so we have you know self self safe field bus excuse me um fsoe uh, we have ethercat safe for safe uh, for sensors scanners uh, that is you know connected here for example in this uh, in this cell by by insight um, on the cs9 you know we have safety board for safe functions we have safe drives on the arm on the tx2 line uh, which is you know from the tx240 to the tx2160 uh, and we're actually releasing this week at automatica also in germany the tx2200 which is going to be a, a robot uh, up to 170 kg payload over two meters of reach that will be able to do the same type of application fenceless, which is going to be very unique. Uh, it's going to be available in hygienic and in standard. Um, so for standard applications or food grade applications, so it's going to be a, a unique uh, one in 
one in the world uh, type of robot um, of that size, but it's gonna have the same feature because it's gonna have the same CS9 controller, uh, the same um, digital safe encoders on the arm. We have a DSI board um, on the arm, you know, that has brake and valve control, uh, safe encoder management. So we have all those like safety functions and safety hardware. Uh, and that comes standard of our CS9 uh, uh, controller and our TX2 robot. So all you have to do if you want to switch to fenceless collaborative applications is you just have to get a license that's added to the controller. But it comes standard of all our TX2 robots and their controller. Uh, you have that uh, possibility. So again, as we talk about ret retrofitting, uh, sometimes you know people buy robots and they don't uh, have a need or they can't do uh, fenceless collaboration type applications right now, but in the future they might be able to. So they can keep the same robot, just add the license and, and move on to a, a collaborative type application. And the big thing, like uh, we were saying, is that you know you get a Stobie robot, um, so you get the you get the technical uh, performance, you get the durability, the reliability of the machine, uh, you know, without having to deal with a uh, lightweight cobot that has some other you know challenges that is not as maybe uh, sturdy on the mechanical side uh, so that's the big thing that we wanted to offer that we're offering here of insight on this great uh, co-pilotizing demo uh, that has been working really well uh, i don't remember exactly like what pace you guys are, are rating uh are, are reaching excuse me Heath, on, on that demo as far as like boxes per minute but i think it's it's a really pretty good um uh, pretty good uh, uh output uh with this machine and it's available in hygienic and standard i think too right yeah, if, if if we have the if we can run the robot at full speed, we have the area to do that. We can run about 15 box a minute, 15 boxes a minute, or or products a minute. You know, we do other products besides just boxes for palletizing or picking. So about about 15 picks a minute. If you're just picking one product, obviously, you know, like I said before, with the you know added uh, payload on it, you can pick up um, you know multiple boxes or multiple products at the same time um, to be able to to speed that rate up as well. We have reached the Q&A portion. It looks like we've got a question that's come in. Um, first one is, do you partner with scanner companies like PNC or provide your own sensors? Um, as far as sensors go, um, we've used uh, Kian's, um, uh, uh, oh man, now I'm going blank. Uh, we use Kian's, we've used SIC, um, and Cognix uh, cameras. Uh, we generally use Cognix cameras. Um, we've also, uh, you know, but I mean, we're, we're not tied to those. Um, we're, we're happy to integrate other camera manufacturers. You know, we really just try to look at the application and figure out what's the best camera um, or inspection for, for that application because, you know, e each one kind of has their advantages. Yeah, on our side, we can we can talk to any camera. Um, so even at, we have cases, for example, where, you know, some end users wanted to use a specific type of camera and they came to us because they couldn't use it with other uh, brands of, of robots and so they came to us in about you know a day or less than that we had an engineer that created a drive for it and then um, you know we were able to actually use that, that camera system without a problem so again you know that's not an issue for us uh, we don't do any integration so we work with like insight you know for them to to integrate all those pieces together but uh, we can talk to any device okay the next question we have is do you sell direct or through distributors I'm assuming really that question is for Stably, maybe? I would assume it's probably for you, Matthias. Yes, so uh, we only sell uh, direct. Um, and again, since we don't do any integration, so our customers are integrators like Insight Solutions, uh, which is a strategic partner uh, of Stably. And so uh, we work with them uh, or we work with some OEMs, but yeah, we typically sell direct. We don't have any distributors for the Stably brand. Okay, we've got some other questions. How do you determine what robot to use for any application? I don't know. If, I, I guess I can I can jump on that, and you can add in, Matthias. Uh, I mean, it it really depends on. I mean, you you really have to start with uh, uh, speed. You know, the space that you have. Um, you know, really just looking at it, what what makes the most sense um, as far as the you know which robot to use. Um, 
you know, at, at that point, once you kind of have a general idea, um, you know, we we have the Stobly software to create simulations. We'll also work with Stobly and their engineers to create simulations um, and kind of and just get that feedback. We can um, generate an engineering report to show uh, basically that the the robot will be, will be able to hit the rate with the robot head. You know, that's kind of designed for it. Um, um, Stobly is really great at that. You know, I would say with my experience working with all the other robot manufacturers, I would say Stobly is probably the um, the most uh, hands-on and involved um, robot integrator or robot provider, which we really prefer. Um, you know, they want to make sure that the application is going to work. We want to make sure it's going to work for our customers. So it's a it's a really great collaboration um, when it comes to determining what robot you want to use. Is it going to work? Um, you know, and then kind of creating a simulation to, to show that to our customers before we get, um, you know, too far down the road. So you have anything else to add to that, Matthias? Yeah, well, first, I appreciate the feedback. So thank you. Uh, thank you for the, <laughs> the great feedback. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you guys are happy with the, the support that we provide. Uh, it's kind of yeah, a good segue, I guess, to the previous question. Uh, the reason why we sell direct uh, is because we want to be involved on the technical side of the applications. Uh, we, we're a family-owned company, the Stubby name. Uh, weighs a lot uh, for us and so we want to make sure that when we implement robots that are going to be successful that uh, people are going to have a good perception of our products and our company and so that's what we're really uh, you know we're really involved with each project uh, through you know partners like insight but uh, but we we do get involved on the technical side we have an applications engineering team that does support uh, insights team when we do projects that sometimes talk to directly to uh, end users as well to validate projects before we take them to people like insight. And so to do that for us, we look at uh, basically three main uh, basic criteria. The first one I would say is the, the type of robots that we're gonna need. So do we need four degrees um, uh, of freedom? Do we need six degrees of freedom? Do we need a four axis or a six axis robot? Uh, is it going to be a standard you know, pick and place from a conveyor into a tray or are we going to try to handle something, present it to a camera for inspection and then rotate into a box, for example? So that's going to determine what type of robot do we need, we need uh, four axis, six axis. Then we're going to look obviously at payloads. So how much, you know, uh, how much the product weighs? Um, is it, you know, typically scare us, you know, we go up to 8.4 kg. And then if we have to go uh, higher than that, we have to switch to a six axis robot. So like it's the case in a lot of like dairy applications, for example, with those cheese blocks, uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, pick and place with six axis robots just because of the payload. Uh, because one thing you have to consider is not only the product weight, but also uh, its shape, obviously, and also um, the weight of the tool that you're going to need uh, that, you know, Insight, for example, is going to design. So how much is that going to weigh? Uh, how much inertia uh, is that going to exert on the robot? So we look at that. And then the last one um, is uh, speed. Uh, so we look at rates. Uh, also, how many, how many parts per minute, uh, how many products per minute that we need to handle, for example. Uh, so that's going to dictate also uh, if it's, you know, really fast, uh, we probably should tend towards a SCARA if we can. If it's slow, then we have more room for six-axis robots because they're they're moving slower with two additional like, degrees of freedom. Um, but uh, sometimes, again, depending on the payload and, and the degrees of freedom needed, uh, that's going to be the, the two main factors, but speed is often also what we consider most. And then, um, you know, other factors like collaboration, is it going to be fenceless or not? If it's fenceless, you have to have a six-axis robots because the SCARAs don't have brakes, for example, and uh, they don't have the, the same uh, safety features as the uh, the six axis robots because they're built for speed they're built for you know being in a cage and run as fast as they can it's not suited for collaboration so if you need collaboration if you need to go fenceless for example we'll tend to go to a six axis so that's kind of like the main uh, you know high uh, high level questions that we try to answer right away when we look at the project to determine which robot we need to use Another question are, where are Insight offices located? So Insight um, is located in Stratford, Missouri, which is just right on the edge of Springfield, Missouri. Um, that's where 90% um, of all of our products are designed and built. Um, our other brand, which is our liquefier uh, high shear mixtures and blenders are all designed and built in our Kansas City office. We've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, how do you measure the risks for operators? Do you want to take that one, Heath, maybe first? or 
I, I guess I'm trying to think on how, I, I guess, I don't know. How, how do you, you know, why don't you go ahead, Matthias? How do you take that? Sure. Um, so for us, it's uh, uh, because we're we're selling a component of a, of a cell. Uh, our role when it comes to that is is quite limited. Uh, we don't uh, we don't get involved in the risk assessment. Uh, although you know we know you know what uh, a risk assessment process is and how it's supposed to be done and that it needs to be done. Uh, that's the case. You know, sometimes we have people that you know want to use. A six-axis robot for a collaborative application uh, with a product that is, for example, a metal piece that is very sharp uh, that is not suited at all for for you know collaboration and to be close to operators without a fence around. Uh, so we we kind of you know sometimes do that sort of consulting beforehand and we say okay we think that this is going to be problematic for for collaboration because of safety reasons but then you know we let people uh, integrators or end users perform their own risk assessment. Uh, I also know that there are some companies that offer that as a service so we do have some contacts if people need. Um, I know like people like SIG for example they have a group that does offer risk assessment as a service and so um, that's typically what you know how far we get involved in that but we don't go any further because we only provide a component of the final machine so we cannot be really responsible for you know how that's going to be used in the in the whole uh, ecosystem yeah so it, it, that that's a good point I'm, I'm with you now it took me a second to kind of wrap my head around that one um I, as far as the uh you know the full robot integration um you know we we do our own risk assessment you know all of our uh, all the materials that we use are, you know, designed, um, you know, for safety for the for the operators. You know, obviously, if we're doing a fully enclosed cage, you know, everything, you know, everything would be able to withstand uh, for if for some reason the robot hitting it. Um, Stably also allows us and their software to build um, kind of workspace areas where the robot isn't allowed to go out of. Um, and for whatever reason, it would go out of that workspace area, it would automatically stop. Um, it does also allow us um, with applications with the safety um, controller in it to limit the joints and the movements with an actual safety um, on a on a safety rated limitation. Uh, that's a kind of a crude way to say it. There's a there's a lot more detail that goes into that, but um, basically that you can limit the robot's movement, um, you know, with the safety controller itself and not just with soft limits in the in the software. Um, we do risk assessments. Um, if it's a fenceless application, um, you know, we we do all the calculations based on what OSHA tells us, speeds and rates and distances have to be. Um, and we also will work with uh, the customer's safety team. Um, generally, it's been our experience that um, when we're trying to uh, install a safety or a fenceless application that the safety team becomes very aware and um, we're more than happy to work with them answer any of their questions um, you know provide any documentation our fenceless palletizer that we sell we've had a third party group come in like Matthias uh, commented on and um, evaluate that for us and give us their feedback as well because um, because we want to be safe you know we don't want anybody getting hurt um, you know or injured on the manufacturing floor yeah, I think just by hearing what you just said, Heath, I think something I can maybe add to on our side. So uh, just as far as like the machines are concerned, the robots, uh, we are TUV certified. So it's the certif certification that we use for uh, anything safety. Uh, so we have an official certification that is done by uh, the TUV uh, organism. So that's what we use for, for that. Great. Thank you for our attending our webinar. This concludes our time today. You will receive a recording following today's webinar. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Okay, looks like everyone's out. Um, feel free to log out and I'll get this closed down. Thanks, Matias. Right. I appreciate it. It was great. Good talking with you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Heath. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. Thank you, Amber. Right, appreciate you guys. It. Bye. Yeah. Bye.